Is it the Year of the Dragon? Year of the Dragon Quest? Or perhaps Day of the Dragon? Because not only did we get Dragon Quest 11s on the Switch, but we also got these three retro releases too in Dragon Quest 1, 2 and 3. And while I'm very excited to try Dragon Quest 1 Sunday, the retro fiend in me couldn't stop myself from being more excited by these old ass games. And that's why today we're going to take a look at them on the Nintendo Switch. Now before we get into this review, I just want to state that on the eShop these are technically three separate releases, so you can buy the games individually. Instead of reviewing each one on their own, I thought I'd give an overall review and consider them more of a package. And that's mainly down to these three games actually getting a physical release on one cartridge. Yes, Asia is getting the three games in one with English sometime in October. Sadly, it seems Europe, America and Japan are not. But it's very easy to import if you want to find out where, I'll pop a link in the description below and pinned comment that will lead you straight to the juicy stuff. Anyways, on with the review. Now, I know what many of you are thinking, why re-release the first three NES games together? Why not include the fourth game in the series that was also on that console? Well, if you take a look at the story, it kind of makes sense. The first three games in the Dragon Quest series actually have an overarching narrative taking place in the same timeline with the third game actually being a prequel and the beginning of the entire series, at least as far as I'm aware. It's what's known as the Erdrick Trilogy after the original hero and while perhaps the plot takes a backseat compared to modern RPGs, it's still interesting enough, especially the second and third games once they realised what they were capable of. I wouldn't say that these are going to be stories that will stop and make you think or give you a massive wave of emotion. Remember this is the very early days of genre, so writing was still in its infancy and were more of an afterthought than anything else. Still, you're getting a nice introduction to the legendary series with these stories. The gameplay is your standard RPG affair. I'm not going to go into individual detail on the releases, but considering these are pretty much the grandfathers of JRPGs, it's fair to say they are pure distillation of the genre, containing both its charming simplicities and its undeniable flaws. The first two games are fairly simple in terms of game mechanics, walking around towns and dungeons, fighting random battles, my word, many random battles, all with slightly archaic principles. They are not the breeziest of RPGs to tackle these days, but would we want them to change the game drastically from what it was? No, that's not the point. They're classic games, warts and all. The third game is the star of the show here. The first two are more curiosities, slightly too basic to truly get invested into, especially for a newcomer to the series. But three is where the series takes off. It's very ambitious with interchangeable party members, a more open world feeling, a day and night cycle and so on. Compared to the original NES release, they have seen some quality of life improvements. Not a whole lot, especially compared to other retro ports that we've seen, but enough to make them a little more bearable by today's standards. For example, there is a quick save feature where you can save any way you want to from the menu rather than having to trek to a castle and speaking with the king. Also, the commands have been eradicated. Originally, it was old school in its approach of having you choose different commands from a menu to either talk to people, inspect things, open and so on, which while was the norm for the time, test people's patience these days. Thankfully, all of these have been mapped to the A button, so you don't have to worry about that. You don't have to choose anything, it's all automatic. One of the biggest changes for this release and the mobile version it's based on is the visual style, which I'm sure about 95% of you absolutely loathe compared to the original NES sprites. The backgrounds and environments are retro in style, but not from the original NES game or the Japanese Super Famicom remake, but they certainly are more of a 16-bit style and I do quite like it a lot. I'm sure someone can point out exactly which re-release these backgrounds are from, but I'm not personally sure. The character sprites are now hand-drawn, in what I've seen being described as something from Microsoft Paint. Something which I totally understand, especially when looking at screenshots, but in playing the game, it's actually not too bad. They don't stick out quite as much and, call it sacrilege, I do like them. Yeah, I said that. I actually quite like the enemy art and the battle arena art. And this is coming from someone who had a major prejudice against it going into it. Uh, I quickly grew to like it. I know I'm going to be in the minority here in that one, but I'm not going to sit here and lie to you just to follow the trends. I do like it. I'm sorry. 
all of the games play in widescreen, which I'm very thankful for, so no letterboxing or board art cover-up things. Uh, I wish more retro releases would do that. Sadly, there are no gameplay mods to smooth the rest of the stuff out. There's no stopping random encounters, which, if you play the second game, is borderline painful at times, where you can literally move two steps before getting into the next battle, like over and over again. Uh, there are no battle assists or grinding assists, which, again, is a shame because these three are some of the grindiest JRPGs ever in terms of both XP and money. You need to grind here. I think they're a little more balanced than the NES originals, like I think the inns are cheaper to use and you can level up a bit more quickly, but not enough to ease the pain fully. Uh, I would have loved a speed up feature too, but again, it's not here. I'm not sure why they did it with Final Fantasy, so why not in Dragon Quest? It's a pity that it's bare bones in this regard, as really, of all Square's re-releases so far, these are the games that could have benefited from them the most. It just doesn't make sense to me. The music is not the 8-bit tunes that you may be used to, but an updated version of them. Again, like the visual style, I'm not sure if these are brand new mixes for this release or they've been taken from another remake. The audio fidelity sounds quite good, at least for what it is. Many consider these tunes to be classics from Kochi Sugiyama, who is, shall we say, a controversial figure in regards to his business practices and political standpoints, but you know, I can look at the art rather than the artist. But I'm not gonna lie, I've never been a major fan of what I've heard in the past. Admittedly, all the music I'd heard up to this point was out of context, generally away from playing the games that they were intended for, but either way, it never struck me as amazing or anything. Even playing the Dragon Quest XI demo, even with it being fully orchestrated, I thought some music was actually quite bad actually. The simpler compositions found here fit more snugly though, but it honestly doesn't even come close to what Nobuo Uematsu did for Final Fantasy. I'm aware the series has its musical fans, and although it's decent, I'm not seeing anything masterful here. It's just decent. Fitting. That's it for me. Please don't crucify me. On the eShop, these three Dragon Quest games are being sold individually, all for different prices. Why? Well, I don't know. Square Enix have been very slapdash with their prices of retro releases, but anyways, let's take a look. Dragon Quest 1 is £3.99 on the UK eShop and $4.99 on the US eShop. Uh, that's super cheap for a JRPG, even one slightly as archaic as this one. But when you look on the iOS App Store, at least in the UK store, it's £1 more expensive here, even though it's pretty much the same game with slightly different presentation. Dragon Quest 2 is weirdly priced at £5.39 in the UK and $6.49 in the US. Again, it's slightly more expensive than it is on the App Store, which is 40 pence cheaper than the Switch version. But, plot twist, Dragon Quest 3 is actually cheaper on the Nintendo Switch compared to the phone version, at least in the UK. On the eShop, it's £9.79 compared to £9.99 on the App Store. On the US eShop, it's $12.49, so altogether you're looking at about 20 quid or $24 for three of them together. Three classic JRPGs filled with nostalgia for 20 quid? Yeah, why not? Yeah, you can get flashier, bigger games for less if you look at something like The Last Remnant, I don't know why, but these games carry a lot of weight to them. Plus, go back to a simpler time. I have zero nostalgia for them, but I paid 20 quid for them and I was happy to do so. Although I suspect a few of you will disagree with that. Of course, that's digitally. As mentioned at the beginning of the video, these games are seeing a physical release packed together. Asia are lucky enough to get all three games on one cartridge with English included. Now that's the dream. Uh, I'm sure many of you have already pre-ordered this, which is due in sometime October, but if you haven't already and you want to add it to your collection, for me, this is one of the must-have imports, and I'll pop a link below in the description and pinned comment as to where you can find it. It's an affiliate link, so if you do purchase from our link, we will receive a small cut which helps us out massively. So if you want to support the show and buy the game, consider using our links. Before we get into my final thoughts on this overview of three retro games, if you've enjoyed this video, hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. Join the Switch Watch community. Plus, we'll be giving away a very, very tasty prize once we hit 50,000 subscribers. If you're a regular, then please continue to show your support with a thumbs up and a comment. It tells us that you're interested in what we do and gives us massive motivation to keep going. Honestly, every comment makes us so happy. Overall, 
either if you're nostalgic for or looking for a peek into the past of one of gaming's premier series, then these three Dragon Quest games are a fun adventure into gaming history. Sure, they may look a bit dodgy to most of you in these updated versions, but I actually have grown to like the art style in a weird way. Maybe some can't look past that and I don't blame you, but for 20 quid in total, you're getting some classic games and a lesson in the history of the godfather of JRPGs. For someone who hasn't had the chance to sample them, it's a great opportunity. But in today's market, they are quite archaic which stops them being easily playable today. But as a package on their own, I'm going to give it a 7.5 out of 10. Not exactly great to play today, but still a fun adventure into the past. Now, I've always been more of a Final Fantasy guy, so consider heading over to watch my exhaustive reviews of that series on the Nintendo Switch. There's just so many to check out. Also, check out my weekly physical releases list to help you out to see which games are releasing on a cartridge on a week-by-week -week basis. I'll see you guys over there. Take care.